Waiting has become a foreign thing to our culture. We, we long for instant gratification. It doesn't matter if it's the curry coffee pot, the microwave, your fast food, or relationships. Why does it seem to take so long? If you can think back, some of you, it's a long time ago, but when you were a child and looking towards this celebration time, and it just seemed like Christmas was forever. <laughs> you were waiting for some of these things were going to come, and yet the promise that we're to talk of today, to them it seemed like they were waiting forever. They, they, God was not coming through in the way that they thought he would, and that may be where you're at today, because we can grow weary of waiting. You know, we, we go weary of going to the doctors. You know, sometimes we go weary of our children or your grandchildren. Um, you can go weary waiting for God to come through when it comes to the promises that he's made within his word. But God keeps his promises. And he keeps his promises on time. And I don't know about you, but um, on time <clears throat> has not been a strength for James, okay? You know, and we, we, we won't name them, but there was a certain child in, in my family who was like, okay, if we're going on vacation, when are we leaving? What's the time? So you set a time, and then for the next two hours, when you were not leaving on time. He was then reminding you how many... It, it, it's that characteristic that some, some of you have, and it's a great thing that you can be an on-time person, and that that's just the way you manage it. And others, you're more on African time. You know, you just show up when you show up, and that's when you go. But God keeps his promises. But his watch is not our watch. And so being able to find his time as our time is a key thing. Because otherwise, you can think he, he's not coming through. When they were waiting several thousand years for him to come through, had he forgotten? No. Absolutely working to the intimate detail what he was going to do. But I think for some, It didn't seem like God was on time. And that may be where you're at today, where you're wrestling with that thought of, you know, wh why has God not changed things? Why has God not come through? Or why is God allowing things to get darker or worse? And it may be in your life. It may be in your world. We see that certainly in our world. But in Galatians chapter 4, there was this statement made, and this has been prodding me for several weeks now, and it's Galatians chapter 4. If you want to turn with me, I'm going to start with the first verse and then read through 7. But in this perspective today, I hope that you'll see and grow in your ability to say, there's a God who's on time that you can trust, no matter what you're up against today. Now this I say, as long as an heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is an owner of everything but in that he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the Father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that, he might, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because... You are sons of God. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God. This whole fall focus that we've been looking at this beginnings, and, and God made this promise in Genesis chapter 3 that there is going to come a snake crusher, and he will crush the one who put us under this curse. But that's a pretty long wait from Genesis chapter 3. 
But it says here, and that this has always struck me, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. And the plan was not delayed, but it is long. Do you see that in your own life? Is it that God may be working in your life and it may seem delayed? It's not delayed. It's long. If that makes any sense to you, that, that idea of saying he, he hasn't forgotten what he's doing. It just takes longer for some of us to be shaped in this process. It's longer for this process that, that he's working not just with us, but with his whole earth. Not just with this earth, but with the universe that he is bringing the glory that is going to go to himself as the creator of this world. But in the fullness of time, God and, and that's just where I, I want you to root your heart, that God is going to come through in the fullness of his time. I don't know what you're up against, but I know who's with you as you come up against that. And so God has a plan. And it's kind of interesting because for some of you, it may have been a surprise early on in your life, but you know, God gave us a baby. <laughs> That, that was his plan. And, uh, you know, babies change plans, don't they? <laughs> they change plans constantly. There, there's this constant adjustment that you're needing to make to a baby. Because, but God had a plan, and he sent us his son as a baby. And, and this is so beyond our comprehension. I mean, it's not that you haven't heard the story before. Um, if you raised in this planet, on this continent anyway, you know this story. You, you've heard that he sent his son. But the idea that he would send his son as a baby, is, it again shows you this plan that goes, all right, I'm not in charge. Have you, have you ever noticed that by yourself, by the way? <laughs> you're not? <laughs> you're not in charge? We like to take charge, or we like to try to take charge, but he's the one who's working his plan in your life. And he didn't ask for permission, did he? He's working. And, and so this idea, am I going to come in line with the sovereign king and say, what you're doing is good? Well, I, will, I, will I trust him? Because he made a promise. And he will keep a promise. It doesn't mean it won't be without pain. In fact, he promises it does include play. He promises it does include difficulty. We live in a world, even within the church, where people say, no, it's going to work this way, and it'll be just nothing but roses. Well, if you've ever put any roses, they generally come with thorns. You know? this, this life has difficulty, and that's, that's a part of your plan. But the danger sometimes as we go through this pain is that delay can feel like denial. God's not going to do it. He's not going to come through. And, 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 and so unbelief or doubt or discouragement can, can grip you. You're saying, I, I don't even know if I want to stay with, with God in this process. But he's going to be faithful. It says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? That we might receive the adoption of sons. That we might redeem those who were under the law. That he had his work. He had this plan that he was doing. And so God accomplished his redemption plans by sending Jesus for us with perfect timing. Perfect timing. Was it perfect? Absolutely perfect. Did it seem perfect? Not to them. And that's an interesting thing. Is it's a lot easier to look back at stuff and see, wow, God did that just amazing. But in the, when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't always feel so amazing. It feels like a mess. It feels like difficulty or hardship. But God will always do what God has promised he will do. Will you trust him? It's not always the way we expect. In fact, <clears throat> maybe discouraging to some of you, but seldom. <laughs> 
doesn't come out the way I expect. All right? But the timing that we desire. One of our missionaries once told me, he said, the people in, in their village described these people who came to work with them and they're Americans. And they said, well, they're those people that wear their God on their wrist. <laughs> Everything is according to our time. Everything has to have. That's not the pace that he works with. So do I want his will or do I want my stuff? But I have to come to this place where I'm willing to say, I, I can trust him and he will keep his promises. And I don't know what you're with today, but I can pretty well guess that everybody here has got some pain. We do, don't we? We've got some difficulties. We have some hardships and things that are, are not going exactly the way we wish they would. But you can trust him to keep his promises. Have you lost hope with that? You know, this glorious celebration that we're entering into as the Advent is what? It's a celebration that God keeps his promises every time. And so he sent forth his son. And we, we see that story in Matthew chapter 1. We see that story in Luke chapter 2. And it tells this truth of, of this work. But 500 years before, Isaiah wrote, for there will be a child born to us. There will be a son given to us. And a name will be Emmanuel. God had his promise. God has a plan. He, he's working. Are you trusting? So, so in that spot, when, when that pressure comes, can we, can we rest in him? Because here's the deal that I found. <laughs> Only God can fulfill God's work. Only God can fulfill God's work. But we have this other plan. Um, there's a couple of them in, in the Bible, quite a few. I call it the Hagar solution. God's not coming through quick enough on this plan, so we're going to help God out. We do a good job of that, don't we? We are still dealing with that. Today, 4,000 years later, you're going, that Hagar solution wasn't too good of a solution. Or, or are you maybe making some, what I call the, the Saul choice? Well, I was forced. I, I just did this because this and this and this and this were happening so that I disobeyed to obey. Hello? But we do that, don't we? We, we come up with these rationalizations as opposed to just submitting ourselves to saying, God can fulfill God's work. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I know this. I can trust him. Because what I found, for me, and it may not always be true for you, but if I'm not willing to wait, I'm not willing to believe. There's something I'm not resting in. And so this idea says, I want you today to say to him, I believe you. Yeah. I don't know what it is that you're against, but that is one of the things I want you to be thinking about. Is can you tell God with the situation that you're facing, I believe you. Not, I expect you <laughs> to do this. We, we, we do that pretty well. And we're, we're, we're pleading with him and we're asking for this. To, you know, no, I believe you. Because if I believe him, I don't know what the details will be. But it'll be good. Amen? And so in, in that spot, he says, this one was born, how? Of a woman. I never thought I'd come to a spot in our culture. We had to explain that that's the way it happens. <laughs> but we do. We have people say, no, you, you, you can be born of a man. No, you can't. Just, just a little, little truth from the word of God. Born of a woman, this supernatural process was being done in some very human activity. And those of you who have done the nine months of carrying, that's a pretty complicated process. It's a difficult process. But, you know, God's trying to give you a clue what's coming. You know, <laughs> he gives you nine months to get ready. It's like, it is going to be nothing like you've ever experienced before. 
But the God man was sent to be born of a woman. That was God's plan. It's a supernatural event, but this normal process in that Jesus Christ was born, the Bible says, of a virgin. They think God created this conception. But it also says an interesting thing out of when you read the story in Galatians here that we're reading from, he says he was born under the law. Well, everybody has a law somewhere, but that's not what they're talking about here. They're talking, he was born under Jewish law. He was a Jew. He had a descending line. He had a place. And this is one of the things that, that Jerry was bringing out about just a little while ago about the genealogies, that you have a place in God's plan, and this child had a place. In God's plan. And there is a, an amazing line of genealogy that shows God's work in his plan. But I don't know about you, but sometimes when you look at genealogies, they can be messy. You know, this whole thing we can do nowadays with the DNA tests, at your risk. What you find out wasn't what you thought sometimes in families and situations and, and difficulties. But, but God was working his plan in this situation because he said his son was going to be born in this family line at, in this way. Why? For a particular purpose. Do you see that? He was born of a woman. He was born under the law, verse 5, so that, here's the reason, so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. He buy back. He was born to buy back. Why? Why? Because we had sold out <laughs> to the devil. We, we had come under his bondage. And so there was one who had to come, the sinless one, the son of God, to buy back for God. So he was come to redeem. Now here's the deal. God has a plan. If you'll trust him. But when Joseph and Mary were feeling like, this is, this is a glorious plan. Is that what you've read in your Bible? You haven't read your Bible. Joseph and Mary had some trouble with the plan of God. They were submitted to God, but trying to figure out how to work it out was difficult. And it was costly. And if you follow God in this life, it, it will be costly. It doesn't mean it's all going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's all going to work out the way you think it's going to work out. But he is at work to fulfill his promise. And so he says in the chapter before this, verse 13 and 14, he says in the chapter 3, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That, that I deserve to be cursed, that I deserve to be separated from God, and he took that upon himself. So it's where it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that, in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. So Jesus Christ paid a way for us to be brought back to God. It was not something we earned. <laughs> We disobeyed. We denied. We wandered, right? How's that a good plan? It's good that you have a shepherd who's willing to seek wandering sheep. Amen? And, and, and we understand that, and yet we don't sometimes. And yet there's that promise in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. You might read it together with me. This just reminds us of this promise that God is working this thing if you're willing to trust him. Read it with me. But God demonstrates his own love toward us 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love, amen? He didn't just declare it, he displays it, okay? But he displayed his love where? Towards you. And I've had people even this fall who, you know, I know God, you say God's a God of love, but people argue with me about this very concept. No, no. There are things in life that happen that I cannot, by my logic, which we all know is limited, can explain how, how God's love is being. But when I look at the cross, he's made a point forever for you and me, that I would demonstrate his love. Why? Like that verse. God demonstrates his love for us in while we were yet sinners. When we still had this incredible need, he displayed his incredible love. And, and that's where we are. Saying, okay, can I rest in the one who would seek me when I wasn't seeking? Can I rest in the one who would love me when I wasn't loving? God initiated our rescue. Because we were not good enough. <laughs> but we are trusting his goodness. He came in our place. And so it says that we might receive the adoption as sons. That, that we'd be welcomed into his family. So faith in him, faith in his work... It brings us forward. Because he's the one who's going to redeem us. We're the one who's going to receive that work. We receive his redemption. It's, I trust what he did, what he paid for. And there's times when people argue with that. And they're trying to be good enough for God. I could say you're going to get tired. You, 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 just, you know, keep pedaling. You, you, you got a long ride. Are you ever going to be, I'm perfect as God is perfect? If you're not, you're not good enough. Then you needed a Savior. We need a redemption. We need it to be bought back. But we receive that. So you, you come into God's family through birth. Okay, we call it rebirth. And the Carters have been... In the news here lately, and it was Jimmy Carter's era. I'm starting to date myself a slight bit. But uh, born, what? Again, became this very, very common public concept, the idea that you have to be born again. When he said that, people were like, what are you talking about? He, he had a tremendous opportunity to witness. But are you going to trust his plan? You see, when we trust him, I'm I, I really not that smart of a guy, but I want to tell you this. this, is, this I'm, I'm absolutely certain of this. God's got a better plan than you do. So why are you arguing with him about it? Why are you stressing with him about it? He, he's got a better plan than you do. And when I come into gratitude, when I come into that place, that, that I will trust him because what? Because God knew the right time to send Jesus to this earth. He knew the right time to send his son. And we wrestle with our delays. We wrestle with our own defeats. We wrestle with our own denials. But what I'm calling you to is a trust a person, not just a promise. It's not just something somebody said. It's someone that we're inviting you into relationship with. That's a completely different process. It's not just some facts on a page, but it's the person who wrote this for you to know. Look what he says as he goes on to this thought. Because actually, I think some of the, the best news is yet ahead. He says that he might redeem those who are under law, that he might, we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That we might receive the adoption as sons. And the next phrase is what? Because you are sons. You are sons? 
You have been placed in his family? Now, it's an interesting thing. Within the culture of Rome, adoption was different than birth. Duh. Okay. But the idea of their standing was that to be adopted was you were given the full standing of being the adult. You are now being placed in the family and honored and accepted, not as a child, you know, be quiet, we don't want to hear you. No, I'm honoring you as you're, an adult. you're brought into this place of honor and placed within his family. But he's the one who's redeeming it. He's the one, it's his work, it's done his way by what? His son, so the glory goes to him. And, and you're in this spot saying, I don't know how to fix this. That's okay. He does. He's the one who's doing his work. I don't know how long it takes. He doesn't seem to be in a hurry. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that about God? He does not seem to be in a hurry. I mean, we, we all think, that, hey, a thousand years is one day, and one day is just a thousand years. Now, it just depends on which way you look at that. It can be fast or it can be slow. We tend to look at it as what? Slow. Is your life slow? It just seems like it's going faster and faster. But look at this, this principle. Here's the principle that I wanted, I wanted to point out to us today. Is that God redeems and adopts believers as family through faith in Jesus. It is this work that he says, you are sons. He goes, we, we might receive the adoption of sons because you are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. God is the one who redeems, and God is the one who adopts. You trust his work. You trust his promise. You trust his person. And he works what? He works the change. God provides not just a path to forgiveness, but acceptance. I don't know about you, but... (laughs) There have been times in my life, I've got to be real careful, mom's here today. <laughs> but uh, you got yourself in some pretty serious trouble. And um, my parents really didn't engage in a whole lot of lecture, or at least I didn't listen well. But we went to the woodshed more than once. What was the point? The point of the correction was I was their child. I was loved by them. And they loved me enough to show me the way I was supposed to walk. Can your father do that with you? If he's redeemed you, if he's adopted you, if your faith is in Christ, will you trust the process that he's in with you? Because he says here in verse 6, you are Sons. Now, if you work hard enough, if you come to church frequent enough, if you do enough things, if you give enough money, no. He says, you are sons. That is a process that comes by faith. Not by works. Not by your effort. Not by your performance. Now, if you ask my mother, she'll tell you I was the perfect child. <laughs> no, she won't. She's, she's back there laughing at me right now. And, and, and she and my father, you know, consistently informed me <laughs> of wrong choices. Why? So that I would make right choices, right? There was consequences. Listen, did that make me their son? I want this to lock in because there's so often is I'm, we're trying to be, people say, I'm trying to be a good Christian or I'm trying to be a good son or I'm trying, no, you are a child of God if your faith is in Christ. If you're not, then today I invite you, put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. But if your faith is in him, then you are a son of God, all right? Now, at that point, you are a child. There's only one question 
that, that is left to me. Am I going to be an obedient child <laughs> or a disobedient child? In the home I grew up in, am I then going to be a disciplined child? <laughs> Disobedience always led to discipline. Okay, that was pretty consistent, and it's lo and behold, it's right there in Scripture. So as you look at yourself and just walk with God, this is not about, I need to perform well enough to be accepted. Some of you grew up in families like that. It's a tough spot. To somehow you're trying to earn your position in your family. That's not the way your heavenly father operates. He said, you are. Sons. He says, therefore, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. So faith it transforms slaves into sons. You had no right, no place with God. Through the work of Jesus Christ, you can trust what he's done. And he says, you're adopted. You become a part. You have a place. Now, if you go to church often enough, no. If you, if you obey every instruction he gives, no. You are his son. You will now move into either walking in obedience or walking in disobedience. That's a whole different message today. But listen, his spirit is what's transforming you to begin walking in fellowship with him. You don't always walk with him just because he's working in you. Am I making any sense? This process that says, hey, I've been born again, doesn't mean I'm walking out the walk. Look how it's put in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. I'll have you even read it together with me. He says, however, read it with me, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If the Spirit of God is in you, then you belong to him. It's not by your performance, it's by his work in you. And that makes us family. And so, so that work is what transforms the slave into a son because I now have a new connection. And it's Pictured so well in this passage because he says, What? You cry out, What? Abba, Father. Okay? And, and that is both Aramaic and Greek. So the Abba, that's from, from the Aramaic, and it's the idea is it forwards or backwards, it says the same thing. It's what a child does. Abba, Baba, Daddy. That's really what it translates for us in our English is, is Daddy. But father is from the Greek, pater, at Latin. The father. He's the, so he says, father, father. It, it doesn't matter how you're coming to You're coming to the one who's father. Abba, father. Now, I don't know what your perspective of God has been. But when he sent his son, he changed an awful lot of our views, didn't he? Because Jesus demonstrated who the father was. And I I meet people today who even say, well, there's there's the father and there's there's Jesus. And I'm I'm more happy with Jesus. I I don't get along so good with the father. What? Okay, that's some serious messed up thinking. He's the reflection of the father. What you see in Christ is the father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But can you call him Abba? See, I, I don't know what your, your household is like, but, but when you grow, is, 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 is he Father? Is he Daddy? Can you pray Daddy to God? Because that's there. And it's an interesting thing, because when your children get older, dead, they want something, it's father. <laughs> but if they're in trouble, and if they have pain, 
What do they say? Daddy. Daddy. There's a union that comes by us being joined to God by the Spirit. And from your own hearts, he says, he can cry out saying, Abba, Father. But how you see you in the family of God is very significant. Do you see yourself accepted by him? Do you see yourself as a son, not a slave? You see, when the Holy Spirit came, he gives you a DNA test. No, he places his DNA with you so that you'll know you are a part of this family forever. You belong to God. So it is the spirit who then transforms the, the, the slaves into sons. By faith, we approach him. Abba. But I, I have found this thing, I struggle with it, how to articulate this so what. Well, so, so listen to me carefully and, and let the Spirit hopefully interpret. But I have found that many people accept his salvation without embracing his adoption. They know they're going to heaven someday. They don't know that Daddy loves them today. So someday God's going to come through and he'll take me to heaven and that will be glorious. And it will. Hallelujah. But he loves you right now as a son. He's adopted you. He's put you in that family. He gives you the full rights. There's been, so to speak, a spiritual transaction, a legal transaction in the heavenlies that's already taken place that puts you in the family of God But that doesn't mean your heart's embraced it. And you can still be trying to prove to daddy that you're a good enough daughter, that you're a good enough child, that that he wants you in this family. That's not the way the book's written. That's not the way he instructs us to live. But I find an awful lot of believers who are there because you've been deceived in thinking he doesn't want you. What I've done is too bad. What I've done is too far gone. That's why he died. That's why we needed a savior. Listen, when we go back to that, trying to perform well enough to make the father happy with you, it says two things. Number one, you're lying to yourself from the start saying the father's not happy with you. And number two, you say, my performance will make it better. You're lying about yourself, and you're lying about your father. Grace says you've been accepted into the beloved. You've been adopted into the beloved. Now listen, that doesn't mean you haven't received correction. If he loves you, he says he chastised. That's Hebrews 12, the whole thing. But correction is not rejection. It's love. What's he say? The Holy Spirit has sent forth the spirit of his son. The God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. So the spirit of who? Of his son. Do you see that correlation? That this Holy Spirit is now called the spirit of Christ, he he does that several times through the Testament. This this blend of the Trinity is expressed in beauty right right here in this phrase right in front of you. That you would cry what? That you would cry, Abba, Father. That you'd say, Daddy. Because what? You're no longer a slave, but a son. If you're an heir through God, you belong. If there's nothing else you hear from me, if your faith is in Christ, you belong. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what he's done. You belong. Some of you grew up in families where you didn't. And, And sometimes that's pretty tough to twist this whole thing through. 
to say this is what the word says, not what I've experienced. But listen. Our three boys contributed in all sorts of sports and different things, and afterwards, sometimes they'd invite boys home, and when boys come home, they come home what? Hungry. <laughs> and you're feeding tons of food to the kids. And it didn't matter who they brought in, you just fed them. But they weren't your son. But he's made us his son. He's put us in this family. There's a difference. You have a dad, a heavenly father that you can call to. This whole thing could just turn into this conversation of prayer because that's this, that is the relationship he wants to have with you. If you're a son, then you're an heir. I won't be able to go through this in great detail, but listen. Listen. My identity as a child of God has now secured my eternity. He secured my relationship. He secured my provision. He secured my future forever. Not because I'm going to become good enough, but because He is. And that's the one I'm trusting in. In the original languages, this is what they call this first class condition. You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. He's saying this is absolutely the truth about you right now. I'm not saying if you'll do this, this will happen. No, you have been born again into God's family. You're his heir. His blessing, his wealth, his provision is yours. And so my question for us today is saying, are we living this life as sons? Or his slaves. Because the one who he sent at the perfect time for us invited us to have your heart and your mind changed by believing. There's a verse in Psalms 23 it says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Some of you have been through some agonizing things. But it does not mean daddy doesn't love you. Because you look what his own son went through. And yet, it has been the most glorious provision for us through the suffering that Christ went through. So God's doing something. So what's your view of God? Have you believed that he accepts you as you are? Now, as you're going to be, I'll, I'll do this <laughs> someday. See, that comes back to, are you living as a servant? Or are you living as a child? Pastor Warren Worsby put it several different ways, and I liked it. He said, the son has a father, but the servant has a master. The son obeys from love. The servant from fear. The son is rich. <laughs> the servant is poor. The son shares the father's nature. And the servant does not. And the son has a home. But the servant has a house. The word of God says, if your faith is in Christ, that you are sons of God through him, that you have been adopted into his family. Friends, you're sons of God through faith. In this world that we live in right now, we are headed for dark times. Darker days are yet ahead. I don't care who we elect in what continent, I don't care how this war or that war, the book has already told us darkness is coming. But we walk with him who is light, and he who is the light has called you into the light to reflect that light now as his son. 
Listen, God knew the exact right time to send Jesus to this earth, didn't he? It's, it's a whole detail I couldn't even go into today. But I want you to know something else. God knows the right time to send his son again to this earth. And it's coming soon. Amen? Yes. So, God knows. Will you trust him? Because you can trust God to keep his promises on time. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just would ask, as we prepare to celebrate communion and sing another song of worship, we want to step into this place of family with you and see who we really are in Christ. And so we're, we're needing you to continue to instruct us that we would take the identity by faith that you have already purchased for us. And so for the one today who, who has not yet come, I ask that you would draw them. For by grace we are saved through faith. That of you yourselves is the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. Will you, will you save today? And for those who've been saved, can we start living as the saved? Can we start living as the sons? Can we start living by the promise, trusting in the Father? We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask those who are serving if they would, this time, present the elements one of the amazing things about communion. In taking it together is that we belong. I was a part of, I had attended a service by a different organization. <laughs> and as they passed the elements through their organization, not a single person was to take an element. Not a single person was to participate. And they had this whole celebration. And it was a large gathering, and we had to leave. We were not able to have this conversation. And like about a week later, one of their group had come to my house to visit. And I said, hey, I, I, was, I was at the remembrance meal. Oh, you were? How, what'd you think? I said, it made me really sad. And he goes, sad? And, and I literally had nothing rehearsed. This was the Holy Spirit just talking to this person. To me. And they go, why was it sad? I said, because the very point that God had in establishing communion was that you're accepted and that you belong and that you're a part. And the very elements that you serve said, you're not here. You don't participate you haven't attained. Praise God, he attained. If your faith is in Christ, this communion is for you. We have an open table because our Savior made the way open for us.